Karen Ho. Karen is the head of corporate and community sustainability at the WWF. Karen's also gonna be talking about transparency and its importance in terms of driving impact. So ladies and gentlemen, please give a very warm French Chamber welcome to Miss Karen Ho. Karen, Joel San. Joel San. <laughs> Good morning. It's so great to have me here to share a perspective from an NGO world. And then, um, yeah, this is my presentation today. I'm going to talk about transparency and its importance of uh, making real impacts. So for those who do not know about WWF, I just want to have two slides to share with you our work uh, around the world as well as um, in Hong Kong. Um, we are a global conservation organization. Uh, we have activities in about 100 countries. And then globally, we have 5,000 employees and uh, we have about uh, 5 million supporters around the group. And here in Hong Kong, uh, we are established in 1981, and then we have about 35 supporters. Um, here in Hong Kong, we have six pillar works, and of course our mission is to build a future that a uh, human can live in harmony with the nature. And then among the six pillar of work, uh, the first one is water and wetland. Uh, we manage the Maipo uh, Conservation Reserve wetland uh, for the Hong Kong government. And then the other very important pillar of work is about ocean. Ocean conservation is very important in Hong Kong, and for those who live in Hong Kong, you probably know about the third runway development, the Hong Kong Zhuhai Bridge, that has a lot of influence on the ocean uh, ecosystem. And then we recently announced that the number of Chinese right dolphin has dropped down to 46 from about uh, 160 uh, several years ago. So it's a significant uh, reduction, and we actually really want uh, to advocate the government to designate a 10% marine protected area such that this species will not be endangered to extinctions, and at the same time, they have a home. And then the third pillar of work is about climate and energy, and everybody knows about um, the human activities actually uh, emit a lot of greenhouse gas to the atmosphere, and then if we don't address to this issue properly, we will enter into a point of no return situations. Um, the fourth one is about wildlife, and people may be strange that um, why do we want to work on wildlife in Hong Kong? We don't even have tigers, we don't even have any uh, extinct uh, animals. Um, however, Hong Kong being an international hub, like a lot of other things, there are a lot of trading. Like recently, we have a big bang on the ivory trade, and then we also want to use our influence to um, work with other Asian countries such that um, the wildlife will not be endangered. And then the fifth and the fourth one will be the local biodiversity. Um, Hong Kong has a very good um, country parks. There are about 40% of the land area uh, country parks. And this gives us a huge biodiversity. And to give you just a number, um, the Hong Kong just a very small city. We have about one third of the China's um, number of species. So it's very, we, we're very proud of it, but at the same time we want to protect it because it's growing a lot of noises saying that we want to use the country park areas to develop properties. So that's an area that we need to really have a careful scrutiny. And then the final one is about uh, education. Um, our Hong Kong office do have a, a very strong education team um, going into primary and secondary schools to build awareness. And at the bottom of the slides, you can see that there's, these are different conservation areas that we have in Hong Kong. Like what I said, we manage the MIPO Conservation Reserve for the government. And at the same time, in uh, Site Kong, we have a Hoi Ha uh, Marine, Marine Conservation Education Center. And in Tai Po, we also have an education center. So we do welcome you to visit our centers and learn more how you can um, work with us to conserve the nature. Um, this is the problem or issues that we are facing today. Uh, we are living actually beyond the planet's boundary. Um, this is according to an ecological footprint measurement. We are consuming on a global basis 1.7 uh, Earth's resources. And to just supplement you with a number on a local context, if everybody lived 
the lifestyle of Hong Kongers will need 3.9 Earth to support our living. So we all know that we can't find one more Earth. Well, I can't find uh, a cells of, um, in the Tobo or in Amazon to buy one more Earth. So this is the boundary, and then we got to, to work on it. And how can we do it? Um, the easiest thing is to increase the biocapacity. Um, this may be a new term to you, what is meant by biocapacity. Um, actually, it's the amount of land and sea area in order to generate resources to support our daily living. Give you an example. Um, the land area may be used to grow crops or to, for grazing cattle so as to support food to ourselves or the sea areas to um, use for fishery or seafood to support our daily uh, uh, eating. And then the other part will be a very, very major part is um, the forest, especially the, the uh, forest that is used to absorb the carbon emissions. Because again, scientists already told us that they are 95% sure that uh, human activities emit so much uh, greenhouse gas emissions to the atmosphere. And then the only way is to really to absorb it. Although a lot of people are working on carbon sequestration technology, but right now the most effective one is still to be absorbed by uh, the lateral forest. And then the area that we need to use to absorb the carbon emission is probably we need half of, it, half of the land area that we, we have on the world. So this is on one way that we want to increase the bio uh, biocapacity. And on the other hand, we also need to consume smartly. Um, we don't want to consume uh, lead a wasteful consumption lifestyle. And at the same time, we also need to reflect ourselves um, whether we need to be so materialistic. And of course, um, the other thing is, um, shall we look at an economy model like a circular economy instead of a linear one? So these are the things that we, we need to reflect ourselves and at the same time need to address because we are already living beyond the planet's boundary. And then this is a, a study from the World Economic Forum, the, risk, the Global Risk Report. Um, you can see that out of the top five risks that they identify, Four of them are environmentally related. So, and a lot of them are talking about extreme weather, um, the danger of uh, climate mitigation or adaptation failure, and also the water risk and that kind. And then not just is uh, environmental issues, but it already affects our uh, human uh, system in a sense that, okay, climate change, a lot of the carbon are being absorbed into the sea and then lead to acidification of the sea and then it will go to coral breaching. And then we know that if the coral is not healthy, then the entire fish ecosystem will be affected. And then it affects our food system, um, whether it's the fishery or it's the seafood system. And then on top of it, Okay, you may say that, okay, it's a, a natural thing that we have little effort um, to improve it. But on the other hand, uh, human activity is also affecting this, the ocean's health, healthness. Um, you imagine that the disposable cutleries that we use may end up into the oceans. Or even unintentionally, if we buy a, a garment, a, a jacket that are made of polyester, and then um, when we wash it and then through the sewage system, the microplastic will go into the, the marine system. And then we already have scientists identify that there are plastics uh, being eaten by fish. And then you can imagine that it go back to the, the system that affecting our health. So it's already very intimate that uh, we need to address the issues and it's affecting the human health already. So, how are we going to address this system? Um, I have gathered two quotes from here because um, it looks like that today's uh, symposium is talking about that transparency. Um, Deloitte has a report showing that, okay, transparency is an imperative. Uh, why is that so? Because it's a process to make sure that you have risk management. 
And then the other consumer research have told us that um, transparency can foster your brand loyalty. 94% uh, of the respondents, um, this survey has interviewed about um, two, over 2,000 respondents. And then 94% mentioned that um, they will support the brands that offer them total transparency. So you can see there's a challenge of uh, risk management and at the same time there are opportunity being transparent will foster your brand loyalty. Um, the other report uh, uh, published by KM KPMG talking about how the global 250 uh, companies are addressing the issues of sustainable development goals developed by United Nations. So you see that uh, a lot of them are addressing climate actions as well as responsible consumption and productions. So over 50% of the companies are addressing these two issues. Uh, while on the right hand side, there are far lesser people or companies that take concern on, like the life on land or the life under the water. So they are not much concerned about it. So I hope by this presentation, I, I can inspire you to work more on this SDG goals. So um, the first one, um, it is a Hong Kong initiative with the name of low carbon manufacturing. And then I put it down addressing two of the SDGs. Um, the first one is responsible supply and uh, consumptions. And then the other one is climate action. Why is it related? Because the whole idea of this program is to engage factories to measure their carbon footprint. And at the same time, WWF will facilitate them to adopt the latest energy efficiency technology, as well as to help them establish a greenhouse gas management system within their own factories. And by so, do, so doing, we also want to see how good they are doing uh, with a third party verifications. And after that, we'll even grant them uh, certifications with the label. And you can see in the middle part that we have four different levels of achievement. Um, why do we design a program like to have four different labels? Because we want to encourage the suppliers, the factories to have continuously improve. And then they won't be um, uh, stopped think they're like, uh, okay, I've done so, because we all know that um, there are never enough. So we want to have them continuously, year after year, to adopt new measures, as well as to reduce their carbon emissions uh, on the corporate basis. And we also work with brand owners uh, to recognize the effort of manufacturers. So I'll show you a video um, on the program. Let's talk about the natural capital consumed by the manufactured products. Climate change is perhaps the biggest environmental issue in the world, which poses increasing threats to the natural resources. The resulting resource scarcities will impact all of us, including the manufacturing sector. To help manufacturers become part of the solution to climate change, WWF Hong Kong developed the Low Carbon Manufacturing Program, the LCMP which aims at reducing their carbon emissions. The program provides a carbon accounting tool to help factories measure their carbon footprint. It also equips them with best practices in carbon intensity reduction, greenhouse gas management and energy efficiencies in both general utilities and manufacturing processes. After a third party verification, Manufacturers are given platinum, gold, silver, or certified labels, depending on the requirements they meet. Clothing brands are asking more for the environmental standard of their products. For example, Marks & Spencer launched its Plan A initiative, which aims to protect the planet by sourcing responsibly, reducing waste, and helping communities. The company has also recognized the LCMP as one of its Plan A attribute for its suppliers. Also. Gap mentioned that they strive to reduce greenhouse gas emission of processes like design, materials, sourcing, and transportation. The company also works to reduce carbon footprint and improve energy efficiency of its suppliers. Zhongshan Yida Apparel Limited is a subsidiary factory of Crystal Group, which specializes in the manufacture of jeans. Yida joined the LCMP in 2009 and has adopted many carbon reduction measures.
Sustainability is one of our core strategies in Crystal Group. Low carbon manufacturing program help us to achieve our environmental vision. By applying the best practice from this program, it's easy for us to start our journey to become a low carbon factory. We have started to tailor make some green measures in production lines, which helps us to improve the reduction progressively. We believe that our environmental commitment not only to conserve more natural resources, but also to gain trust from our customer. I believe this is one of the reasons why we are the sustainability pioneer in the industry. WWF supports LCMP companies through training sessions, seminars, webinars, factory visits, membership and documents management platform, and free inquiry hotline, which help them make affordable and sustainable low carbon transformations. They also receive regular updates on industry best practices and the latest global environmental news. A yearly report details the average performance of all LCMP factories. Outstanding accredited companies are also recognized for their performance at our annual awards ceremony. Companies joining the LCMP improve their energy efficiency and carbon performance, realize cost and resource savings, highlight their environmental vision to investors and the market, raise their brand image, strengthen their competitiveness and stand out in the market, become prepared for future global regulatory challenges. Since its launch in 2010, the LCMP has been a huge success. In just the past two years, 24 LCMP accredited companies avoided 134,000 tons of carbon emissions compared to the business as usual scenario. The carbon the program has kept out of the Earth's atmosphere would take almost 6 million trees one year to absorb. Underlining this conservation victory is the fact that these companies also cumulatively grew by 92% during this period, proving that it's possible to grow and thrive in the marketplace and reduce carbon at the same time. WWF is committed to combating the worsening effects of climate change to the environment and the society. The achievement over the past few years proves that the LCMP can enhance the operational efficiency of the factories by reducing their carbon emissions and consumption of resources. We invite you to join the program and build a zero carbon future with WWF together. It's not only the government's and individual responsibility to combat climate change, Corporations should play a leading role in global carbon reduction. Please join WWF's Low Carbon Manufacturing Program now. Okay, um, the program has been uh, working with brands as well as manufacturers for about seven years now. And what is our takeaway from this program? Uh, we believe we have built already a model of collaborative effort, um, co-creating both social and environmental uh, victories. Uh, why do I say so? The video already showed you the conservation achievement, like um, the carbon tons that we helped to avoid uh, represent six million uh, trees that we need to plant every year. Um, but on top of that, uh, we can see that um, there are social benefits in the sense that uh, companies that have joined the program, the employee loyalty, we really find it uh, becoming very well. Um, the employee feel like uh, the company are so care about the environment and then they also want to lend the effort and be more loyal to that company. So that's one of the, the takeaway. And then of course, to implement a successful program, we definitely need the top management's uh, support, and then they should um, express it clearly to different departments or different functions uh, so that they can be aligned uh, with the objective. Oftentimes, we'll see that um, the compliance department or the sustainability department may come to a suppliers on one issue, on one uh, objective. But on the other hand, when they go into the buying side, again, I may be asking them for a low, low price. So the messages could be inconsistent, and in that sense, your suppliers will not be able to really work on um, the two things. So that's why we take uh, away that the alignment of messages between departments within an organization is very also very important. And the third thing is about um, the monitoring tools. When we talk about uh, we want to evaluate a supply chain's performance, um, how do you evaluate? Uh, you need to have an objective uh, parameter or a measurement unit 
And in this program, LCMP, we use the carbon tons as a measuring unit, and it could be very objective. Um, putting all your environmental impact into one unit, and then you can measure it over time whether you are achieving what you want to. And of course, um, the final thing will be like, uh, you need to work across different uh, part of the supply chain because the supplier is not only supplying to one brand. So if the brands can collaborate, and this morning I heard that um, the SAC have actually 120 brands working together, and this is really very good because you can set one standard or one objective for your suppliers and then they can achieve it e more easily. Um, so much about manufacturing. The other initiative I want to share with you is on sharp initiative. We all know that Asians like um, to eat sharp green shoe. Um, but recently, after years of efforts by my colleagues, um, the cultural things has uh, seen a big change. And then right now when we go to Bangkok, a lot of restaurants are already uh, offering alternative menu without shark fin shoe. And then how we work, um, the strength of WWF is a global network. And you can see that my colleagues actually are in Hong Kong digging out the import data. And then when she finds out there's any uh, strange things happening in different uh, regions, she will contact the other our counterpart in the other countries and then work out a solution. And you can see that by such doing, it's really effective. And the result you can see throughout the years, um, apart from just building awareness in the local market, um, the actual import of shark fin are also decreasing by 31%, and it's really a conservation victory. And then the latest thing is uh, my colleagues in Australia are piloting a blockchain um, to use these technologies to improve the transparency of tuna fishery. Uh, what happened is they tried to put an RFID onto the tuna fish when they first catch it, and then it, the data will put all the way across the supply chain, like going to the uh, factory and then to the can uh, process and then to the retailing. So it is a pilot that my colleagues in Australia are working, and I really also want to explore whether blockchain will be a good technology to address the apparel supply chain. So, um, so much about the business case sharing. Um, what my view of um, the sourcing company in the next decade, of course, we all know that 2015, um, the Paris Agreement was signed by 194 countries, and then this is very uh, a big, big issue. And I believe um, sourcing company can play a leading role uh, beyond compliance as well as beyond risk management. Um, because even the, the, form, the, the structure of the Paris Agreement is like asking individual countries to express their effort in how many percent they can reduce over time. So by the same token, I would ask each of the sourcing company, if you can work with your value chain partners to come up with a number, what kind of percentage you can reduce across um, the entire collaboration for the environment. And of course, uh, we need to do a lot of more collaborations um, for creating social and environmental goods. And then um, a final thought will be like, um, if we are doing something good for the environment as well as for the social side, um, your business must thrive. So that's so much for today, and then thank you very much. You can reach me at this email address, and then we believe together possible. Thank you so much. Thank you.